Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us here at my YouTube channel and my podcast. Uh, this is a very special day because we have Han Xiao with us. Uh, I hope I'm pronounce, pronouncing yeah. it right, Han. Uh, Han, he's uh, the founder and CEO for Gina AI, a company that has a very exciting product that's called Run Perfect and uh, another suite of products. So welcome to the show, Han. Yeah, so uh, thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Ham. Uh, how yeah. you got involved in uh, artificial intelligence? Yes, yeah, so uh, my earliest uh, contact with uh, artificial intelligence uh, so it can be back to Trace back to uh, my bachelor study. That was in 2008 and 2004, uh, where I tried to be uh, a Bayesian model for uh, predicting the topic of uh, the authors, uh, the papers from the authors. So back in the days, there was like a, a, the trendy method algorithm that people use for implementing AI or implementing natural language processing is actually not all these deep neural networks that we were talking about today. It's actually those Bayesian models. Uh, but that was like uh, 15 years ago. And then when, uh, you know, uh, after my bachelor in China, I came to Germany, you know, did my master and PhD there working on machine learning, but not necessarily deep learning because back in the days, uh, you know, between 2009 to 2000, it was not like a deep learning or deep neural network was not really easy mainstream technology in the industry and also in the academic. You know, TensorFlow start, Google released TensorFlow since, uh, you know, uh, and also PyTorch comes afterward, right? So the deep learning wasn't really popular back in, back 10 years ago. And then after my PhD, I, I joined Salendo, work on the search and recommendation using deep learning, right? So I tried to uh, learn deep learning outside the university, right? Because uh, it turns out that all the methodology, the theoretic theories that we learn from the university actually uh, becomes obsolete uh, thanks to those deep learning hype. I think this uh, same thing happens again uh, today, you know, when GPT, chat GPT came out, right, in 2023, at the end of 2022. So we see a lot, a lot of algorithm uh, methodology in the natural language processing becomes obsolete. So people don't need to use very, uh, don't need to build very ad hoc algorithm for, let's say, for doing name entity recognition and so on. They can just a single shot with GPT, with using prompt. So, and then after that, I worked many years uh, in Salendo, work on search recommendation. And then uh, in the middle, I jo uh, came back to China, joined Tencent AI Lab, continuously working on search. And then in 2020, during the COVID time, I, I quit Tencent, come, came back to Germany, built this Gina AI. Uh, in Berlin. So basically that is my uh, kind of the short history for me with AI. Yeah. And, and, and why Gina? Why, why the name and uh, and what was kind of like the the idea that you created Gina on? Uh, I mean, see, uh, the idea behind Gina is actually uh, multimodal. It's about uh, implementing multimodality AI or enabling multimodality AI for developers and enterprise. So this multimodal term probably was not really popular back in 2020. So we were really one of the first companies that start, that work on this, that focus on this. So multimodal basically means different data types, right? And so you can imagine like a different file formats is, uh, is kind of like a, a multimodal, right? So if you handle PDF image, uh, video, audio every day, then you can call yourself as a multi-model, right? Because you are you're working with different data types and working with different modalities uh, at the same time. A traditional computer or the software is not very good at working with multiple different data types, right? So for example, if you think about before 2020, most of the algorithm, natural language processing algorithm only works on natural language processing. Most of the computer vision algorithm only works on computer vision. So there was no really interaction between those uh, different subfields in machine learning. There, there are some early adoption, early exploration, but it was not really uh, the mainstream. So back in 2000, with the advance of neural network, we start to see a pattern emerge. The pattern basically indicates that in the future, in the near future, we can use deep neural network to handle multiple different, multiple data types at the same time, right? So 
You can search from images using text. You, you can search videos from audios. You can generate uh, from text, but also generate text from images. You can generate images from text. You can now even generate uh, video from text, right? So basically, right now, this multimodal is very easy to understand. But back in 2020, it was not obvious to a lot of engineers and software engineers. But we actually see that uh, this uh, it's a future, right? So that's why this Gina AI is all up in enabling multimodal AI uh, for developers and enterprises. Right? So we start from doing search, uh, basically building tools, the framework that enable developers to uh, build better search, cross-model, multimodal search solutions in production using all these cloud-native technologies such as Kubernetes, gRPC, and so on. Right. And uh, uh, so regarding the name Gina, uh, I mean, originally we have, you know, kind of like a guided principle uh, how to name the company. We want to make it like very uh, helpful AI, right, uh, to, to give people an impression of, as a very helpful AI, uh, such mm -hmm. as Javas, right, Javas in the Iron Man, right, in the Marvel's movie, like, uh, Java. But uh, of course, we cannot directly use Javas, right? Uh, because it's uh, it's a trademark. That's why we come up with uh, you know more female name, uh, which is Gina. Uh, it is easy to pronounce, and also the pronunciation stays more or less the same across different languages. So that's why you know in the end we choose to uh, use Gina AI as the company's name. Yeah. So it was more like. Uh... The idea of having an assistant or something like that, some, something that uh, that will help you. Yes. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, and, and multimodality. So, so that's kind of like the the DNA is approaching the future. So, yeah. Uh, and the, there's a very big suite of products. I, you know, I started from Perfect, and uh, I was pretty impressed with uh, the from Perfect capability. But the, how do you see across the the whole line this? you know, enabling multimodality for, for developers and enterprise. Yeah, I think these, uh, you know, we have uh, from perfect, or, uh, you know, uh, to aim to become the best developer environment, you know, for prompt engineering. So here, the developer environment is actually, uh, you know, in the in the code mark, because those prompt engineers are not necessarily very hard for software developers, but they can be very good at prompt, and they can do a lot of uh, things right today in 2020. We also have a, pr a product which is called Things. Uh, if you can input the image, so maybe I, uh, it's better that I can share the screen. Um, yeah, if you if you can share, I mean, I, I've I've seen uh, seen explain, and yeah. it's also pretty impressive. But seen explain can do. I you yeah. know I put it on my community hand. I have a community of uh, of people in WhatsApp that we yeah. kind of like uh, share stuff about uh, artificial intelligence every day. Yeah. Uh, and some of them came with uh, kind of like medieval type of art. You, you know, there was also kind of like a Moroccan paint and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. And it explained it perfectly. It was yeah. amazing what it can do. So but please, please explain about yeah. scene explain. Yeah, so I mean, the same thing is also based on the uh, kind of the based on the fine tuned model that we have, a fine tuned multi model model that we have. So basically, you can see it build a very nice correlation between the images and text. Uh, and also, uh, and also, like if you look at all these images, so they, those are non trivial images. So it's not like uh, you, you just uh, have an apple there and then ask uh, what it is, right? So those can be a diagram can be comic stripes, right? Uh, uh -huh. Can be the, the images with text, with a lot of text in that, right? Uh, so, but our model is able to understand this perfectly, right? And also describe to the very details. But not only that, so we recently also add video understanding, re video comprehension, okay. things like So basically, if you upload a video, so it will uh, recognize key events, the summary of this video, but also uh, you know, extracts the key events that happens inside this video. Right? So, for example, here it extracts the two key events. One is happens at the uh, at the four at the at the fourth second. The other is have at twenty second. Right. So, if you click on this, it says a group of people, including individuals in suits, rather uh, gathers in front of a podium. Right. And then the word satellites in North Korea. 
uh, are prominently displayed. Right? So if you click on that, it will locate it to into this very frame, right? Okay. So besides that, it can also generate an audio story uh, from the image. So let's say you upload this image, and then it just uh, you wait for one minute and so on, rather it just uh, output emotional story right uh, based on this image and then you can play this uh, you can play the voice you can play the audio it's actually like a uh, it has narrator like different characters having dialogues and so on right uh, can, can you do that then in other languages other than english yes yes of course yes so okay. you basically for saying explain you can you can always choose to uh, go for uh, any languages right so for example here right. you can choose to go like spanish uh, i will return okay. the, uh, spanish description of the images right uh, okay, so it's, it. uh, it's basically part of the algorithm right so you can uh, when you send an image uh, you also need to specify the language you know you want to kind of like, translate into right and then afterward, it generates the images with all the language that you want. Yeah. Basically, if you summarize, uh, we also, as I said, so in this company, we also work in, uh, besides Chrome Perfect in Spain, we also have a lot of also developer-driven or uh, developer-centered products, such as Gina, Docker Ray. So if you go into that, <laughs> that is a, like a less interesting, depends on who you are, right? So. If you are developer, <laughs> yeah. If you are developer, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> yes, if you are developers, you probably see that oh, this is really hardcore. So like a lot of coding here and there, right? Uh, so we also have uh, embeddings for published for researchers. We also have enterprise solutions and so on, right? But what is it? I, I think a lot of like uh, uh, you know leaders or friends that first visited Gina. It may get confused a little bit, like what is exactly this company is doing, right? Uh, yeah, because it's a lot of tools. So that's yes, what it's a lot like, of tools. Uh, so let uh, me let me kind of like uh, use this, uh, you know, use this chance to explain what are we doing and what is exactly the storyline behind Gina here, right? All right. So basically, if you look at this graph, so if you go to About Us, you see our mission, you know. Uh, in 2023, there are a lot of disruptions, a lot of new algorithms, new methodology, new models popping up right this year. Right? So if you look at AI, AI has never been so crowded, noisy uh, as before, as, as today. Uh, it is really a lot of a lot of hives, a lot of like a, a lot of real stuff, but still a lot of hives going on in the in the in the so basically if we we as a company, as Gina AI, we look at all uh, kind of the technology support future developers and enterprise. And we come up with these four technologies. We summarize that those four technologies, these four particular technologies will support future developers and enterprise a lot. Right. So uh, we believe those four technologies are very, very fundamental. So no matter whether you're a developer or enterprises, you need an AI solution, you will need one of those and most likely a combination of those four technologies. Then what are those four technologies? So these four technologies are basically prompt tuning, right? So basically the idea here is, you know, you're hand handling large language models of mid journey, uh, text to image models, stable diffusion mid journey, or text to text models such as GPT, GPT four, cloud, and so on, right? So you always your your the output of those big models are highly depends on the quality of your input. So if your input is bad, then usually the the output is you know is bad, right? Uh, some models are good. Uh, because it's kind of fine-tuned for the bad input. But in general, like most of the large language models output, quality highly depends on the input quality. So that's why, you know, we need a tool, so we need an algorithm or methodology or framework or project, however you want to call it. We basically need a technology to improve the prompt before we send the prompt into the large language model. So that is basically prompt tuning. Right. And uh, as you can see, we have this prompt perfect, which is focus on the prompt tuning part. And then there is another technology, which is called prompt serving. On the prompt serving side, we have, uh, so basically you can imagine this as those 
applications that is powered by prompt, but it's not, there's no model behind that. Right? So it's basically, if you really look at the source code of those uh, applications, you can find they are basically sending requests, receive the response, manipulate on the response, and send the request again. Right. So there is no really model hosting or, you know, I'm running a model on a GPU and then trying to, uh, you know, manage GPU memory, all this kind of thing. There is no such thing. They basically just send and receive requests and response via API. So in this case, we call those kind of applications as prompt serving applications. So example, such as in the early this year, we have this chat PDF, not we have, but the community has this chat PDF, which allows people to upload a PDF and then you can chat, you can ask questions about this PDF, right? Yeah. So this application is, is a very typical prompt serving application because there is no model behind. All the things is happening on the front end and all the AI behind is basically by talking to OpenAI's API. There is another example which is basically happens in the April or May this year. It's auto this auto GPT is again very typical example of prompt serving applications. There is no model behind, no GPU, NVIDIA driver, Docker, PyTorch, TensorFlow happening, right? It's basically like wrapping all this API, calling the server and receive response, calling it again and receive again. So basically, this kind of applications will become part of the software or will become part of the an enterprise solution in the near in the future, right? So to be honest, there is no shame about wrapping on top of OpenAI's API, right? Because today we have like two biggest cloud provider, which is AWS, right? There are tons of high-valued startups right in us or over, over all of the world that is just a wrapper on top of aws so it doesn't, yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter it doesn't matter whether you are a wrapper on top of something it, it, you should not be ashamed of that the thing is that whether you can provide correct value proposition a correct value adding on top of this wrapper on top of their idea right? yeah that's correct and, and and there's a lot of people that yeah that uh, do shaming on that like Oh, you're you're basically just calling a open AI API, and that's that's all you're doing. Uh -huh. But you're right. I mean, if you if you have value on top of that uh, in a different way than everybody else's, then you know then you have a business. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there are other like uh, two technologies. Uh, so those are the prompt based technology, right? so prompt tuning and prompt serving. And then there is also like a more on the model size based technology, which is, uh, you know, what we focus on because there are like a lot of models like text to text models, text to image model, text to video models and so on. Right? But, you know, in Agena AI, we focus on embedding models. In particular, we focus on embedding serving and embedding tuning. Right? So on, on these two technologies, we have this flagship project, uh, FineQ, and also the Gina. So basically, uh, why we are talking about embedding? So, so first of all, what is embedding? Embedding is basically vector representation, kind of like a mathematic vector representation of a data, right? So, for example, right now we we can see this uh, text, you know, a letter right? as a characters, right? As a string, and the images as a pixel, right? As a, a sequence of pixels, right? Uh, you can see that the underlying representation, the text, which is a string. And the image, which is a pixel, is not uh, unified. It's not unified. So this yeah. makes handling this image and text and video, sound, all these things very difficult because they are, you know, represented different. And then these embeddings come out to write for the rescue. So with embedding technology, we are able to represent images, text, video, audio, 3D mesh, everything into a fixed lens vector, right? So let's say that everything is converted or represented as 100 dimensional vectors, right? Then by, by using this representation, we are now able to compare the relationship, compare the distance between all these vectors, between all these embedding, which we hope that those distance kind of clue for representing the similarity between their semantics. So this is basically the idea behind embedding. And we believe that in the uh, in the near future, let's say uh, for the next uh, three to five years, 
because of this large language model, because of the multi-model AI models, and a lot of core technology, the quality of this core AI application actually highly depends on the embeddings quality, not vector database, not vector database, but on embedding quality. Because vector database is only about measuring the similarity. And there is only a limited and deterministic way of measuring the similarity. Basically, for people who kind of have some background with mathematics, you know that to measure the uh, similarity of the distance between two vectors, you can compute the cosine distance, you can compute the Euclidean distance between two vectors, but there are only this number of, you know, fixed distance metric, right? But when it comes to embeddings, so the embeddings quality, right? So whether this embedding quickly captures the semantics behind this image, behind this text, behind these videos, greatly influence the downstream applications, the quality of the downstream application, right? Uh, so that's why we basically, you know, among all these AI technologies, the bus, the hypes, we carefully choose to work on these four technologies, which basically will define the future of AI. Right. And and all of that uh, with a high focus on power users, developers, and the corporate users, correct? Yes. So basically the idea, you know, our approach, you know, when we run a business, when we run a community, so it's very, you know, very important to kind of get the users, right? to get the audience, to get your yeah. paid customer. So in our view, so we actually work in a slightly different way if you compare us versus other, let's say, open source software company or B2B software company, is that we actually have this three layers funnel, right? Where on the top, we have these power users, right? Which is basically uh, those users bought by from perfect and things. And then okay, so those this, are the ones, yeah. Okay. Yes, and then we have these developers, and then finally we have these enterprise users, right? So okay. if you compare all funnel with other people's as other startups funnel, you can see that we have a different layer, different first layer compared to the others, right? Well, others usually start with developers community and then try to convert some developers into paid users, but we don't work in this way. We work on the first, we try to capture those power users who are very interested in doing prompting, right? By using prompt to build their application. And then with all these prompt users, we convert slowly them developers to hardcore developers or to the paid enterprise clients, right? And the yeah. reason why we build the funnel in this way is also based on our observation in 2023. So let's say the same presentation and the same uh, methodology, philosophy, if you ask me last year, I probably won't answer in this way. And then, but if you ask me today, I, I see this approach totally makes sense. Why? Because if you think about the, uh, you know, right now it's August, it's already September 2000. If you think about what happens in the, first six months in, in the AI industry. It's actually pretty crazy, right? There's a lot of hype, a lot of buzz. But what, what we can also observe is that a lot of non becomes kind of developers in 2023. So why do I say that, right? If you look at all these very popular applications on Twitter, right? Uh, they get a lot of likes, retweets, reposts on Twitter. And uh, you found that those applications are actually not hardcore as let's say before 2020, right? Before 2021. As I said, they are basically a wrapper on top of OpenAI's API, right? Or, or on top of stable diffusion, or on top of, on top of mid journey. But they exactly. are able to generate a lot of value. And value means, sometimes means they are able to create, create a lot of MRR, right? So there are people subscribe, pay for the service, or they are able to generate a lot of hype, a lot of user, you know, from the community. And then you cannot really say that they are developers because, uh, I mean, they are developers, but if you ask, uh, can you install PyTorch, which is really considered as a kind of entry, entry bar for the uh, for going machine learning, they probably don't know how to install PyTorch. They probably don't know how to, you know, okay, you need to kind of serve this model into a Docker container and then deploy this on Kubernetes in order to make it scalable. They don't know and they don't care, but that doesn't matter they still have a very good product 
in the market, right, which is well accepted by the market. So this basically reminds us one thing is that the people originally, like before 2023, without all this chat GPT, large language model stuff, the AI, the development of AI or using AI technology to build a product is kind of privileged to those senior engineers, to those senior AI developers, to the senior AI data scientists, right? Because they have the know-how to, you know, build something from scratch to serve this in the cloud and so on, right? But in, since 2000, all these large language models, ChatGPT, Midjour, they kind of democrat AI to everybody. Now everybody sure. can be an AI developer. Everybody can be an AI engineer as long as you are a good prompt engineer, right? As long as you can speak very good prompt, you can use all this cultural reference, pop culture, stories, famous authors, famous painters when you try to build a mid journey uh, image, right? When you try to generate image, uh, image. You can, you can just be, become a prompt expert without really going to the details of the models, the details of the algorithm. Or the, or the code, you, you, you need to do a, a good prompt and then you can, you can build an application even with no code. Yes, exactly. Right? With, so those, with no code those, tools. Yes, so those users are what I call the power users. And those power users are super important because it actually, you know, in the long future, I even imagine that you know, there is no need learning any computer language. There is no need for learning Python. There is no need for learning JavaScript. Because the future, in the future, people can, can just speak prompt. And then those large language model is responsible for converting those prompt into machine code. It's not human's job to convert a less machine code to a more machine code. Because if you think about the developers today, right, what are they doing right now? They are basically write Python or JavaScript, which is like a machine code, but okay, so there are some semantics, right? So you can do public function, define all these things. There are some semantics inside the source code, right? And then the interpreter, right? The Python interpreter of the comp, which is basically doing one thing is to, com is to convert this very high level source code, Python and JavaScript source code, into a low level binary machine code, right? Zero ones or move yeah. memory address from here to there. But is this really necessary? If we, if in the future that we have this large language model work as an interpreter or work as a compiler, then all the humans, all the human developers just need to speak English or need to speak their own language, right? And yeah. all the yeah need to speak the prompt, and all the other work are actually done by, by the large language model, right? So there's no yeah. need to have some middle layer language such as Python and JavaScript. So that's why I see, yeah, I mean, okay, so maybe I'm crazy, right? So but I see that this is a this is a kind of upcoming future in the uh, you know when 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 prompt technology and the large language model continuously evolve, yeah. Oh yeah, I, I that's that's pretty much my case, Han. I, you know, besides building content, I do I uh, I create courses, and uh, I've been teaching in in my class. I basically teach how to build prompts, right? Yeah. I mean, I I teach basic um, AI concept, but not for developer or everybody. So I I have all kinds of people in my classes, and uh, but kind of like the center of it all, it's it's prompt engineering. And, uh, and yeah, a lot of them end up being pretty heavy uh, power users, and a lot of them end up doing uh, pretty powerful stuff just with the prompts, or eventually going in, into wanting to develop uh, a chatbot for the companies or something like that. So yeah, I, I think that your observation is spot on in terms of this new category of power users emerging, you know, kind of like a powerful force within the community. So tell us a little bit about Prom Perfect and, and, and the future for Prom Perfect and then the future for Gina, because we have kind of like a, a little bit uh, less than 10 minutes. Yeah, yes. I mean, the future of Gina is actually like, uh, uh, you know, we, we start, as I said, our strategy is basically to first grab this power users using from perfect and sync thing right mm -hmm. and then educate them to uh, do more things more deeply right so for example what we have here is a multi-model starter kit which basically if you look at things going on from perfect you can use every applications as an api so there is always an api interface which you can call them 
without using UI, right? So you can write source code and pull them together, right? So basically, you can build higher, high level applications, AI applications that are using all these products, right? So for example, you, uh, you want to have, you know, very smart bridge that you want to kind of take a photo of your bridge and then generate an uh, output, uh, in, uh, like a possible, like a menu. Recipe. You got a recipe from the fridge, right? So you can use things frame from perfect Gina chat, you know, chain everything together, eventually generate a very pretty, like a recipe for your, for your own purpose, right? Mm -hmm. so this, and we also have like a, uh, you know, this, this part is relatively like starter, you know, it's not where there's not really a lot of things going on uh, besides just wrapping all the, all of our service as an API. But if you want mm -hmm. really, you know, work very harder, low level as a developers, as a pre-2020 developer, we also recommend you to uh, look at our multi pack, which basically okay. allows you to build something from scratch. Uh, using our cloud native technology. I believe, so to be honest, like uh, in 2023, at least in the first half year, multi-model stack is not that obvious, right? Because, you know, a lot of people say that, oh, I can do this this and that in long chain right? without the yeah. models. But yeah, so first of all, it is true. We also study long chain internally and we, we admire the popularity of long chain in the first half year. Uh, but I think that from based technology and model based technology, they have to work together in order to deliver the final solution, especially when it comes yeah. to enterprise, uh, where the enterprise, where inside the enterprise, the data compliance, the network, the privacy preserving, all these things become significant. Right? So for example, you cannot use OpenAI's model or for some reasons you are not used, you are not to transfer uh, customer data to the outside. In, in many of the cases, you need to kind of host the models by yourself, right? Inside your network, on your own AWS account or on your own Google account. So in this case, this multi-model stack becomes very useful where you can basically have full control of what you have and where the data is sent uh, inside your system, right? And also like uh, for the future, you know, for Gina AI, we, what we want to provide to the enterprise. So right now everything is kind of in beta because we are still like a uh, heavily, uh, fastly iterating over all the products. But what we want to provide to the, to the enterprise, is actually we want to provide them a fine tuned framework Right, a fine tuning user okay. interface, which basically allows them to easily inject their domain specific knowledge into the large language models and gives very good embeddings. And then people can use this embedding using our inference framework and then deploy this inside their enterprise as a very highly scalable microservice. And once it is deployed as a microservice, they can use it as a part of their pipeline as a workflow and to improve their productivity. But the first thing is, of course, the first question is, for many enterprises or for many companies is that they already know that, oh, this AI, you know, large language model seems very good and uh, ChatGPT is really awesome. Can we have something for my domain? This is a very common question that asked by a lot of enterprises, a lot of companies, right? Big or small, right? And then we want to provide, we want to solve not the whole problem because the whole problem involves a lot of, you know, different partners, different vendors. We want to solve the problem that when company, you know, need a better embed, they can use it for better search or better generation. They come to us, they come to Gina, right? And then by providing this embedding fine tuning and inference, we are able to cover the multimodal AI embeddings part and together with the prompt technology, or some people may know that, okay, so right now there is like a retrieval augmented search, which basically combines the prompt and the embeddings together to deliver better search result. So we can also basically put these two stories together and then to tell an even bigger story. Okay. And the, and the, and the this fine tuner can work with, um, with the LLM, like, uh, you know, work on the fine tuning of Chat GPT, GPT four based um, model. Yes, yes. So uh, um, we, um, uh, yes, we we can fine tune uh, for the uh, you know to fine tune based on the user's input. 
domain specific data, right? So usually it could okay. be if you work in the legal tech, right? So this could be your uh, legal cases, PDF, all this uh, legal paperwork. Then you can, we can fine tune over that and then provide kind of like tailored uh, large language models. And especially those models are very good at generating embeddings. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Han. I, I, this has been such a great conversation and I, I really have enjoyed this. And it's probably also because I identify myself as a power user and, uh, and it's refreshing to see a company that is focused on power users more than just developers. It's more focused on developers, uh, but uh, a great suite of products and a great approach to that. And I really, really thank you for, for this opportunity. Do you have any, any pointing comments, any uh, final comments? Uh, no, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. All right, Han. Well, thank you very much.